Good morning. Good morning. Congratulations again to the new members of the NAE. It was a great day yesterday. I uh, wasn't sure we were gonna pull all that off, but we did, and a tribute to our staff that they were able to put all that together. So, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the third annual special lecture on engineering and society. I want to thank uh, Cleo Caboz, a member of Section 7 of the NAE, who chaired the committee to select our speaker today. Cleo, raise your hand over here. Thank you. Uh, this is the, every, when we select a speaker, we put a committee together of both uh, NAE members, domestic, U.S. citizens, and the international members, and it's really a great exercise, and I'm really pleased at how, how Cleo has run this committee, basically since its inception, so thank you very much. This lecture series zeroes in on contemporary issues where engineers can help shape solutions to advance progress. Last year's special lecture was given by Kay Crawford and focused on artificial intelligence and how machine learning can inadvertently reinforce systems of power and bias. And in 2022, NAE member John Brooks Slaughter covered, he gave the first one of these, that he covered the need to allow all segments of society to participate and reach their full potential uh, to, to the benefit of both engineering and our society. Increasing efficiency and decarbonizing energy systems are key to protecting our well-being, our planet, and our global economy. The innovation needed for the energy transition will require an upscaling of all available technologies. The actions needed are no longer incremental. We must em employ broad efforts to help cr to create a sustainable and an equitable future. It is my honor and special privilege to introduce John P. Holdren as this year's uh, special lectures speaking on meeting the climate challenge. Dr. Holdren has shaped climate policy on the national level and continues to provide critical leadership as a scientist and policy expert. His ability to traverse the interfaces of engineering, science, and technology and policy is a testament to his skill in articulating their importance to society and his and the precision in balancing important trade-offs. For eight years, he served as the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as the head of that and co-chair of the President's Council on, on, of Advisors on Science and Technology under the former President uh, Barack Obama. He helped coordinate U.S. responses to H1N1 and Ebola outbreaks, the Deepwater Horizon, explosion and oil spill and the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Dr. Holdren holds the Teresa and John Hines Research Professor of Environmental Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and is co-director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program at the school's Belt Beltford Center for Science and International Affairs. As director of the Arctic initiative at the Belfer Center. He leads projects to better understand the relationship between thaw thawing perma permafrost and its impact on greenhouse gas emissions, an area ripe for research. He was honored with the 2021 Arthur Beakey Award of the NAE, and earlier this year, the National Academy of Sciences bestowed on Dr. Holdren its most prestigious award, the Public Welfare Medal. Susan Wessler, NAS Home Secretary, rightly said, he has made it his mission to employ science to improve society and ensure that the public policy is informed by research and evidence, greatly benefiting our nation and the world. A dominant focus of Dr. Holdren's work is his engagement with government and public to inform and move towards policies for a better, for a better world. His many accomplishments include being among the first recipients of the MacArthur Fellowships. He holds membership in the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences. 
as well as the American Association, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's former president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. You can find more detail about his careers in your program. And I have a little note here, don't know if it's true or not, and he can verify it. He's an outstanding expert saltwater fly fisherman. <laughs> Do people work with him, so he can comment on that. <laughs> there are few people with su uh, such a firm grasp of science, engineering, policy issues of our time. I would like to thank Dr. Holdren for accepting our invitation to speak and also recognize the selection committee uh, for their efforts. After we hear from Dr. Holdren, Dr. Per Peterson will moderate the question and answer session. Dr. Peterson is a member of the NAE and an expert in nuclear energy and its potential to solve our nation's energy problems. He holds the William S. Floyd and Gene McCallum Floyd Chair in Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. He is also Chief Nuclear Officer for Keros Power, a startup company and, and uh, in developing advanced reactor tech, nuclear reactor technology. And he has an interesting connection to Dr. Holdren, which he will explain in, in his remarks. Okay. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. John Holdren. Well, thank you very much, John, and my thanks to the committee. I'm uh, honored and delighted to have the opportunity to, to give this lecture today. Um, and thanks to my very old friend, Per Peterson, for agreeing to moderate the session that follows. I'm going to use a rather wordy PowerPoint today, and my excuse for doing that is, number one, I'm not in good voice. And so, if I can force the audience to read a lot of words rather than my saying them, <laughs> I'm more likely to get through the talk. <clears throat> and the second reason is I, I like my talks to be able to stand alone uh, so that people who weren't able to attend can follow them and people who were able to attend but found some of the slides too busy to absorb in the time available can look at them later and I'm sure the NAE will make the slides uh, available. So I start with the proposition that advances in technology are a very important part of the solution to virtually every energy-related challenge. And I list uh, a bunch of them here. Uh, you could all make your list of all the reasons that better energy technology are valuable for society. Uh, there are a set of benefits that are primarily domestic, and there uh, are benefits that are primarily global, uh, as listed here. But the key point that I want to make is that the most challenging of all of these rationales for advancing energy technology is how much they demand from energy technology innovation. Climate change is the strongest driver of energy technology innovation. It's the one that determines how much we need to do how fast. And there are a number of reasons for that, and I list them here. Uh, the dominant role of energy sector emissions in the climate problem, uh, the high proportion of energy supplies all around the world uh, that comes from the offending fuels and technologies, uh, the barriers and long lead times that slow the penetration of new technologies. And this is, as I will note later, one of the biggest barriers to uh, the government's and firms for that matter, making the investments that we need to make to have a sufficiently timely and aggressive transition to cleaner energy technologies. It's just it takes a long time. The unmanageable consequences of failing to limit climate change adequately going forward. And the mismatch, the mismatch between energy lead times and the pace of energy system change that avoiding unmanageable climate change demands. For all of these reasons, climate change is the dominant driver of energy technology innovation. Lots of other good reasons, but above all, we need technological innovation to meet the climate change challenge. 
And by the way, the combination of these factors poses a great danger that climate change, the climate change challenge will turn into a climate change disaster. So I'm going to elaborate on these propositions in the rest of this talk uh, in terms of the, of the subtopics I'll listed here. Take a look at them. I'm going to save my voice <coughs> and move right into world energy and climate change to date. So from, 19, from 1850 to 2000, the growth of world population and prosperity brought a 20-fold increase in energy use, and that's including what is often left out, which is the use of biomass energy forms in non-market circumstances for heating, for cooking, for boiling water, uh, and so on around the world. And that's the most of the green biomass at the bottom. Uh, you can see here that the overwhelmingly important role of fossil fuels, uh, both in the latter part of the first century of this period, that is uh, from 1900 to 1950, and then the growth rate twice as great thereafter, again driven overwhelmingly by coal, oil, and gas. And the thing that all too many people recognize about the magnitude of our energy challenge is that even in 2000, fossil fuels were still contributing 78%, almost 80% of global primary energy. Jump to the most recent year for which we have statistics, 2021, last year, and look at the world, China, the United States, and India. Uh, China, the United States, and India being the three biggest emitters of greenhouse gases heat trapping gases. And the numbers here contain a number of surprising messages. One, and again, relatively few people know this, in terms of purchasing power parity, the real purchasing power of different currencies, China has already passed the United States as the world's biggest economy. Uh, they passed this already a few years ago in purchasing power parity. Uh, they have far surpassed the United States in the t use of energy in total. Uh, our fossil fuel dependencies are the same in both countries. 79% of our primary energy, both in the United States and China, come from fossil fuels. And China has far surpassed the United States as a source of uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use. And what is particularly important to our topic here is that two-thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions today, two-thirds, uh, are coming from fossil fuel, nearly all of it in the form of carbon dioxide. Global warming, driven mostly by human carbon dioxide emissions, has been unequivocal for the past 50 years. There's natural variability, of course. Uh, there has been long-term natural cooling. For most of the last 7,000 years, the world was cooling uh, as a result of natural influences. That cooling was initially offset and finally overwhelmed by human greenhouse gas emissions. Without the human greenhouse gas emissions, we'd still be heading for another ice age. We avoided that. That's the good news. The bad news is we overcompensated. <laughs> <laughs> and another very important point, underrated by most people in public life, probably because they don't know what the normal distribution is, is that in normal distributions, extremes change much faster than averages, as we are now seeing. And the reason is elementary. If you look at this graph, it emphasizes it. A small increase in the average leads to enormous increases uh, in the tails. And uh, more hot weather, more extreme hot weather, that, of course, is what we're seeing around the world. At just 1.1 degrees Celsius above the 1900 global average temperature, we're already seeing around the world significant increases in this whole long range of devastating impacts. And all of the impacts listed here, I won't read them to you, all of them are plausibly linked to climate change by theory, by models, and by fingerprints. That is the pattern in space and time with which these phenomena are emerging. On every one of these issues, 
virtually all of the new news from climate change has been bad news. It keeps getting worse faster than people previously anticipated. What this means is that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change agreed in 1992 with its goal of avoiding dangerous human interference in the global climate. That goal is history. It's gone. We're already experiencing dangerous human interference uh, in the climate system. <clears throat> Heat records. You know this just from reading the paper or watching the television or your or your iPad, a stunning the pace at which heat records are being broken all around the world just in the last few years. Oh, come on. There we go. Oops, now I gotta go back. Okay, now we're gonna get it right. So, the insurance companies know this. This is from Munich Re. Swiss Re has the same values. Munich Re Insurance, Swiss Re Insurance, they're the biggest reinsurance companies in the world. They already understood in 1988 when they started running ads in the International Herald Tribune about the need to begin to seriously address climate change because they could see it in the damage claims. And here's the picture in number of extreme weather catastrophes. Of course, there's year-to-year -year natural variability, but the trend is unmistakable. So let's look at scenarios for energy and climate futures. Uh, this is the Energy Information Administration, the USEIA's International Energy Outlook 2021, most recent one to be issued, uh, <coughs> showing uh, primary world energy use by source projected in their reference case, their base case, <clears throat> out to the year 2050. And what you see is, yes, renewables take off in this period. That's great. Nuclear only manages to stay about the same, which is, in short, not enough. <clears throat> and petroleum, natural gas, and coal worldwide uh, either continue to grow or, in the case of coal, stay roughly stable. Uh, here's a comparison uh, from the United States. The annual energy outlook for the United States by the IEA, <coughs> EIA uh, came out in 2022. And you see it's similar. Nuclear doesn't even quite manage to stay flat. Uh, liquid biofuels grow for a while, but don't grow very much. Uh, other renewable energy forms uh, rise sharply, but <clears throat> look how little good it does us in the overall picture. How much petroleum, how much natural gas. The only thing that declines really sharply <clears throat> has already undergone most of the decline expected in the base case, and that's coal. The EIA's reference projection of global fossil fuel emissions is shown here. Basically, uh, you see that emissions continue to rise, albeit slowly. All of the growth projected in emissions is in the developing countries. The industrial nations are all uh, pretty much flat in the reference, uh, in the reference projection. <clears throat> and if you look at what this means for global temperature, uh, the whole range of scenarios by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shown here uh, in terms of the difference from the 1850 to 1900 average uh, <coughs> shows, number one, that the momentum in the climate system means that temperature continues to go up even after atmospheric conditions stabilize. The stabilizing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't stop the growth of temperature. Sea level continues to go up even after temperature stabilizes. But importantly, there's an enormous difference in how much the temperature goes up between high emission scenarios and low emission scenarios. And you see that here. It's worth noting that the last time the temperature was two degrees Celsius above the 1900 level was 130,000 years ago. And at that time, sea level was four to six meters higher than today. 
That's thought to be the equilibrium implication of getting to two degrees C above the 1900 level. The last time the temperature was three degrees Celsius above the 1900 level, sea level was 20 to 30 meters higher than it is today. And again, on geological time terms, that's the expected amount of sea level rise that will ultimately occur if we get to three degrees C above the pre-industrial level. The only question is how fast. The best estimates of how long it will take for that full sea level rise to materialize is 500 years. Uh, but there are mechanisms by which it could happen faster. And by the way, the EIA reference emission forecast that I showed you a minute ago would lead to a temperature increase compared to 1990 in the range of three to four degrees Celsius. That's where we're headed under business as usual, three to four degrees. What do we expect under increasing temperature going forward? A whole series of impacts on human health, already evident, but growing substantially. Further growth in extremes of wet and dry. Further impacts, adverse impacts on agriculture, again, already evident in many parts of the world. Coastal zones, sea level rise, stronger storms, saltwater intrusion, <coughs> all affecting cities and infrastructure. Impact on the oceans, uh, heating plus acidification, plus all the other stresses we're imposing on the oceans, uh, having their impacts as listed. And impacts on national security, relatively neglected until recently, but our armed forces, our Pentagon, understands that one of the biggest security challenges going forward is going to be the rapid rise in refugee flows within countries, destabilizing governments, and across boundaries, destabilizing international relations. Possibilities that become more likely as the temperature increase gets bigger above the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius range, which is the target agreed by the world's governments in Paris in 2015, we can see greatly accelerated sea level rise. Nobody can predict how rapid this might be because the science isn't good enough yet. We can see massive drying and fires in the, what I refer to now as the formerly moist tropics already drying out with big impacts. We can see a crash in most ocean fisheries. We can see the collapse of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which shuts down the Gulf Stream, impacting uh, United States and European weather. And we can see rapid release of methane and carbon dioxide from thawing permafrost and warming Arctic sediments and tropical wetlands, accelerating all climate-related <coughs> impacts. Let me talk about the option space for avoiding unmanageable climate harm. There are really only three options. Mitigation, which means the measures you take to reduce the pace and magnitude of the changes in global climate being caused by human activities. Adaptation, meaning the measures you take to reduce the adverse impacts on well-being that result from the changes in climate that do occur. And the third one is suffering suffering the adverse impacts and societal disruption that we don't manage to avoid by the combination of mitigation and adaptation. And what you need to know about this is we're already doing some of each. We're, we're doing some mitigation, we're doing some adaptation, we're doing some suffering, as I've already pointed out. What's at stake in society's choices is the future mix. And particularly from the standpoint of public policy, we need, we want to minimize suffering. And escaping immense suffering is going to require both a lot of mitigation and a lot of adaptation. These are not alternatives, they are complements. We need them both. We need enough mitigation to avoid unmanageable climate change and enough adaptation to manage the unavoidable climate change. So how do we do it? Mitigation options elaborated, reducing emissions, obvious categories here. I won't read them to you. Again, I think you all know what the categories are, <clears throat> but I'll give you a, a minute to take a look while I save my voice. <clears throat> uh, 
We can increase the sinks for greenhouse gases, that take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. But we can even manage solar radiation if we decide that the benefits of doing that exceed the risks and liabilities. Increase the reflectivity of Earth's surface, inject reflecting particles into the stratosphere to reduce how much sunlight gets through. Getting increasing attention, but very dicey, technically very controversial politically. How much mitigation do we need? The carbon dioxide emission reductions that are needed in order to hold the temperature increase to the Paris goals, 1.5 to 2 degrees C, shown in this slide, and again, some of you may want to look at this later because I'm not going to leave it up long enough for you to absorb all of it, but it compares the a no policy trajectory, the low policy trajectory, the Paris continued ambition trajectory, which is sort of the level one through the middle, and Paris increased ambition and even greater emission reductions. And it shows on the right hand side the associated probabilities for the range of temperatures that you'll end up with if these are the emissions trajectories. And what you see is the low policy case, not the worst case, but the low policy case, no chance at all of holding the temperature increase to 2 degrees C, a 78% chance that the ch change will be more than 3 degrees C, and so on through the list. In order to have a greater than 50% chance of holding the temperature below 2 degrees C in 2100, you actually need negative emissions. Uh, after 2075. Negative emissions means you're pulling more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than you're adding. A uh, number of ways to do that, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. But first, some realities about mitigation options. You can't change the system quickly, I've already said this. We currently have about $30 trillion invested worldwide in our energy supply infrastructure. The normal turnover time for that is 40 years. Uh, trying to change it much more quickly, as we now need to do, uh, makes stranded costs uh, a major issue. And politics, of course, play a big role in energy choices virtually everywhere, another obstacle to changing this quickly. And furthermore, notwithstanding the large role of carbon dioxide, which I've already mentioned, there are a whole host of other ingredients, other heat trapping gases that have to be addressed in an adequate mitigation strategy, and I list a lot of them here. And a final reality is that many developing countries are going to need financial assistance to make the needed mitigation investments, as they also will require for making the needed adaptation investments. Let's talk about policies and investments for lower emissions from the energy sector. Emission reduction policy options and needs. First point is there are a whole lot of energy efficiency and cleaner energy supply technologies that are already economically competitive under today's circumstances and others <coughs> that the private sector will bring to competitiveness in the next few years without any further intervention from government. And those together could put the world on the path to deep re emissions reductions between now and 2030 if they were widely implemented. But they're not being widely implemented enough, not widely implemented in proportion to their current economic benefits. <clears throat> and what we need there in the way of policy <clears throat> is policies to overcome the barriers to deployment inadequate information on the part of consumers, inadequate financing, perverse incentive structures, supply chain issues for the options that are economic now or will be economic soon. Second domain, somewhat costlier technologies could contribute sooner rather than later if the competitiveness gap were narrowed through direct subsidies, tax credits, regulations, and or a carbon price plus improvements achieved through research development and demonstration, both in the public sector and the private sector, and learning that comes from deploying more stuff. You learn how to make it cheaper when you deploy more stuff. 
Of these policy options, most are already to some extent being tried in the United States, in China, the European Union, and India, the biggest emitters globally. But achieving carbon prices big enough to matter is the heaviest lift. That's the hardest one of these to get done politically, even though all economists of all political stripes say this is the most efficient thing we could do, is put a price on carbon emissions. Uh, politicians hate it. <clears throat> Finally, successfully tra traversing the much deeper reduction trajectory that we need between 2030 and 2050 and beyond is going to require higher performance technologies, new technologies that are, <clears throat> in important respects, much better than the ones that are either currently economic or on the verge of being economic. And that means large investments in research, development, and demonstration if they are to be available and affordable in time. Because of the long lead times, the uncertainty of success in any given project, and the public goods character of the benefits, that is avoiding climate change for everybody, governments are going to need to put up much of the money in the early phases of this process. <clears throat> And virtually all respectable assessments of this matter have concluded that government investments in research, development, and demonstration on energy worldwide <coughs> need to increase at least two to threefold over the current levels if the world is to meet even the two degrees Celsius Paris goal, <coughs> never mind 1.5. <coughs> of course, government R&D uh, government research, development, and demonstration is not going to be enough. Incentivizing increased private sector research, development, and demonstration and forming public-private partnerships to facilitate the transition from lab to marketplace are also are going to be essential. <coughs> Beyond technology innovation, of course, policy will need to support huge capital investments in deployment between now and 2050. This picture from the International Energy Agency World Energy Investment Report of 2022 shows that global energy R&D is increasing, <coughs> but it's increasing too slowly. And you see the distribution here among, <coughs> among different parts of the world, with China, by the way, now uh, essentially equal to North America. This shows mission innovation funding. Mission innovation was an agreement initially by 20 and ultimately by 23 countries plus the EU <clears throat> made in Paris in December 2015 to double in five years the clean energy R&D investments of the governments of the participating countries who altogether accounted for 85% of the world's energy R&D at the time. And at the time, 2015, their total investments in clean energy added up to 14.5 billion US 2018 dollars. And you see the doubling target at dotted line at the top. <clears throat> and you see how slow the progress has been in increasing uh, <coughs> these investments. <clears throat> US government energy research development and demonstration is still far short of late 1970s levels. Uh, this is the picture from 1978 to the fiscal year 2023 request, broken down to fission, fusion, fossil, renewables, <coughs> hydrogen efficiency, ARPA-E. Uh, stunning <coughs> how bad our performance uh, has been and is. <coughs> Capital investments. Estimated global capital investments in clean energy infrastructure needed just between now and 2030 to be on the better trajectories. And by the way, here APS means uh, announced pledges scenarios, how much you would need to meet the pledges that countries have already made for reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And NZE is the net zero emissions strategy. Uh, <clears throat> getting the world to where it needs to be, really, if we are to uh, hold the temperature increase to 2 degrees C. And again, they're breaking, the investments are broken down. Uh, low carbon power, energy efficiency, low carbon fuels, and carbon capture, <clears throat> utilization and sequestration, electric vehicles, grids, and battery storage. 
and you see the decline in investments in upstream oil and gas, <coughs> coal supply, mid and downstream oil and gas, fossil fuel power generation. <coughs> A few words about uh, recent policy progress in the United States. Uh, <coughs> the energy and climate impact of the Infrastructure Investment in American Jobs Act of 2021, a considerable, uh, considerable impact, beneficial impact <coughs> on energy efficiency, on clean energy. Very importantly, in my view, on CCUS, carbon capture utilization and sequestration. I don't think we'll get where we need to go without it, by the way. <coughs> Even three and a half billion to establish uh, four regional direct air capture hubs, meaning collaborative enterprises between national labs, the private sector, universities, to try to get 16 million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year captured by 2030 in these two, in these two categories, uh, and investments in non-CO2 emissions. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, most recent one, uh, inflation reduction is something of a misnomer because uh, so many of the provisions uh, relate more to clean energy and addressing climate change than they do to inflation reduction. But anyway, a uh, bunch of categories uh, in that bill with estimated costs in those categories over the period 2022 to 2032. Uh, the biggest one, clean electricity tax credits at over 160 billion and going on down the list, which you can read. Princeton's Zero Carbon Energy Systems Research and Optimization Lab, which is one of the most vigorous <coughs> analytical operations going in this domain, has estimated that the IRA will result in 4.1 trillion in additional capital investments in new energy supply infrastructure to 2032, uh, a 334 billion annual investment in wind and solar photovoltaics by 2030, a 28 billion annual investment in carbon capture and sequestration by 2030, 4 billion uh, annual investment in hydrogen production by 2030, and cumulative greenhouse gas reductions totaling 6.3 billion tons by 2032. The effect of the IRA on energy capital investment is shown here, and again, this will repay later study for the wonks in the group. Uh, estimates, again, from the Princeton Zero Lab of how the Inflation Reduction Act will influence not only the total of investment in energy supply-related infrastructure, but how that will break down among a fossil fuel with CCS, <coughs> fossil, other fossil power, nuclear, wind, and so on. <coughs> the effect of the IRA on carbon capture and storage, again, extremely uh, important. On the left, the no, no IRA case, in other words, without the provisions of the IRA, and on the right, the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act on <coughs> annual carbon dioxide captured for either trans for transport and geologic storage. The projected emissions, the change in U.S. projected emissions as a result of this legislation, again, it breaks it down between uh, <coughs> what the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act by itself does and what additional you get from the Inflation Reduction Act and how much more you would need to be on a net zero pathway. Just a couple of words about the path forward. First, some global trends worth continuing. Uh, you see this again, these are global numbers from the most recent uh, assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Working Group 3, uh, eight, came out in April of this year. You see the trends from 2000 to 2020 in all these important variables, photovoltaics, onshore wind, offshore wind, so on, batteries for passenger vehicles on the right, and on the bottom, the <coughs> uh, adoption rate, how rapidly the deployment of these technologies uh, is going up. Uh, these are all trends that we should wish to continue. 
a wish list, and many of these will receive increased attention in the session that follows this one with a variety of distinguished speakers expert in some of these topics. But it's a long wish list. Uh, <coughs> and it ends, as befits my background among other things, I worked early in my career in the US fusion energy program. Uh, it would be nice to have practical fusion. Uh, it would be nice. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into detail about the barriers that remain to be overcome, but it would be nice. All of these things would be nice. Some of them are harder than others. Some obstacles that need concerted attention. One, the grasp by elected officials of the realities of climate change stakes, the scale of the remedies we need, the time scale of energy transition, uh, <coughs> the lack of an adequate grasp of these realities that we've been talking about has led to a lack of political will to support action at the needed scale. The public grasp of the same is also inadequate, and that has led to a lack of public priority on climate action and a lack of pressure on elected officials. And by the way, today polls show that 70 to 75 percent of the public in the United States believe that climate change is real, it's caused by humans, it's causing damage, it needs more attention, but it still ranks below the usual list of the economy, jobs, can I put my kids through college, the cost of living, international security. Uh, it doesn't have the priority. <clears throat> Big obstacle. NIMBY, not in my backyard, trending toward what I call banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. And we are seeing, we are seeing unfortunately, uh, an increase in the banana syndrome. And it imperils electric grid expansion, siting of even the cleanest energy supply installations, imperils sequestration of carbon dioxide, and disposal of nuclear waste. Environmental antipathy to having a fossil bridge based on carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration of the emissions from the natural gas, particularly, above all, but also to some extent the petroleum that we're going to continue to use. We cannot stop the use of those fuels overnight, no matter how much some people may wish it. We have to capture a substantial part. And the public. Uh, particularly environmentalists don't like it. They say, oh, CCUS is just a lease on life for fossil fuels. We should be against it. Uh, this is a terrible, terrible syndrome. And finally, increasing rejection of public, private, academic, and international collaborations. There is a widespread view that oil companies are evil. Uh, collaborating with them uh, should not be allowed in academia. Uh, we're experiencing this. Uh, syndrome uh, at Harvard and many other places. Uh, my view is that environmental problems, climate change, are never going to be solved over the dead bodies of the private sector. They're going to be solved by engaging the private sector in doing what is required. And we have to continue to build public-private academic partnerships, and we have to, with judgment and discernment, continue the international collaborations that make sense under the evolving circumstances internationally. The failure to do that, the rejection of these possibilities, is leading and will lead to lost opportunities to accelerate progress and to universalize it as we must do. Not enough if we fix emissions in the United States. They've got to be fixed in China, they've got to be fixed in India, they've got to be fixed in Brazil and all around the world. So what should we do? in the science and tech community. We should get better at explaining the realities. We all need to get better at telling stories that bring these realities to life. Uh, and I list them here. I've already talked about all of these. I won't run through this. Time is short. But we've got to get better at explaining the realities. And I wish that every one of us would tithe a fraction of our time to communicating these insights to legislators, other government officials, and whomever else you can get to listen. You should join and take active part in the NAE and other professional society working groups addressing 
energy strategy and climate change. And you should take part in clean energy and energy efficiency collaborations across stovepipes, sectors, and nations. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's now time for us to move into the Q&A session. I think John and I will sit up here. We have microphones set up. And so uh, please um, uh, think through and, and uh, uh, come up prepared with questions. My job is to moderate, and as we're preparing, I, I do want to tell a little bit of a story. I uh, studied my graduate studies at UC Berkeley in mechanical engineering. I minored in energy and resources. So I took Energy and Resources 200 from John Holdren and Mark Christensen. And I, I still remember the lecture on nuclear energy because it was something that I was quite interested in. And John put up a list of the various different things. There were six uh, associated with nuclear energy technology that, that create sources of risk. Uh, he rank ordered them, but he first asked the students in the class to do the same thing. And of course, things like waste were near the top. His, his rank ordering started with the security related issues. Uh, non-proliferation, security of materials. Uh, then it got into accidents and accident releases, and down at the bottom was waste and, and the environmental consequences of emissions. So I, I still use that, that, those lecture notes. I, I put them up in talks to students. And when I do that, and I'm looking out across the room uh, filled with young people, and I, I show the slide with my course notes, and I say, who knows who John Holdren is? <laughs> and in the, that, face, you know, that sea of bright young faces, I've, I've never seen a hand go up. <laughs> right. So then, then I ask the class, well, who knows who Barack Obama is? And uh, you know, cl clearly, the, the, uh, all across, and then I said, well, do, do you know that John Holdren was President Obama's science advisor? And, the, the, and then the, there's this recognition, you know, this is, this is why these things are important. And, and it also says something, we, we need to communicate more. Um, as, as engineers uh, and as, as technical profession, professionals so, so that there's a broader recognition and perhaps greater fame for people who contribute. So with, with that story, let's go ahead and transition to, to the question and answer period. We have microphones. I think they can also be distributed. And please, let's get our first question. Thank you. Um, I also was in one of Professor Holdren's first classes, at least first for me. So. You should identify yourself. Please. All the questioners should identify okay. themselves. Dan, Dan Sperling, oh. um, grad student from UC Berkeley, but professor at UC Davis, and also board member for the California Air Resources Board, and a new inductee to uh, the National Academy of Engineering. <laughs> So John, um, I, I have one comment and one question. You know, the comment is, I want to add something a little more positive to your talk, because it was, it was a real downer. Uh, <laughs> and I know that's not your style, so, uh, or your uh, temperament. But electric vehicles, um, within a few years, electric vehicles on a total cost of ownership basis are going to be competitive with gasoline, not just cars, but trucks. And, and uh, there are policies like fee baits that can make it, make it so that government doesn't have to put any money, almost no money, very little money, into making it a success. And of course, in California, we have a a new mandate that 100% of sales must be zero emission by 2035. The European Union is about to adopt the same. China is on that trajectory as well. So I just wanted to have that 
the question I have, <laughs> and you can comment on that if you want, but the question I have is, in California, so I'm, I'm from the nation state of California, <laughs> and we also have a law requiring net zero uh, for the entire economy society by 2045. And one of the big issues that you addressed is that is dealing with carbon capture, dealing with uh, direct air capture of, of carbon. And as you said, there's tremendous pushback uh, from the environmental community, environmental justice communities. And so I'd be interested in your comments on kind of the technology and the politics and policy of that. How do we uh, make progress? Because I agree with you that uh, and that is the California policy also to, to do that, to pursue that. My answer, Dan, will be shorter than your comment. <laughs> first, first of all, I did try to stress areas of progress and what we need to do as a bit of an upper at the end. My wife and I own two electric vehicles. We are trying to be uh, on the leading edge of this trend. But I think the answer of how to overcome some of the opposition to the sensible things that need to be done is again, we in the whole technical community have to start speaking more clearly and with one voice about all that needs to be done. That is the single most important thing that the people in this room can do. Of course, some of you are, are teachers as your main profession. Uh, you also need to continue to speak with a clear voice, but all of us do, no matter what our profession. Um, uh, good morning, John. Thank you for uh, uh, an illuminating talk. Uh, my name is Kevin Bocut. I'm a senior technical fellow and the chief scientist of hypersonics for the Boeing Company. Um, my question is, I saw you mentioned fusion and I saw one of your charts, nuclear energy. Um, it seems to me like there's really not a solution to this problem without nuclear energy, and you didn't say a lot about that. Do you believe there is a solution without nuclear energy? Where does nuclear energy fit in? So my position on nuclear energy is it will be a whole lot easier to solve the climate change challenge if we can get an expanded contribution from nuclear energy. I will not say that we cannot succeed without it, but it would be a whole lot easier, and that is to say more likely to happen if we could get an expanded contribution from nuclear. And as Per was indicating, uh, I believe that doing that requires that the nuclear industry surmount a number of challenges. One of them is making it less expensive at the same time that you're maintaining a very high level of safety. Uh, another one is figuring out how to manage the waste in a way that's not just technically acceptable, which I think is actually quite easy, finding technically acceptable ways to manage waste, but also that we can persuade the public to accept. And finally, if you want it to expand worldwide, you need to more effectively address limiting the connection between having nuclear energy capability and having nuclear weapon capability. I think all those problems are soluble. But the question is, will we be smart enough and quick enough in solving them? And I'm happy to note that my moderator, Per Peterson, is involved in one of the companies that is doing very innovative work on small modular reactors, which I think uh, offer the best hope for an expanded role uh, for nuclear energy in the relatively short term. Uh, fusion might offer hope, but in the much longer term, it's still gonna be a long time before we see commercially attractive fusion reactors. But small modular reactors uh, could do a great job for us sooner rather than later. Great, thank you very much. Could, could I ask a follow-on question? Sure, <laughs> you're the moderator. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, the Fukushima accident exposed and, and showed us some of the problems with the existing technology and was highly impactful. Um, you were the president's science advisor. I, I was also providing some advice. The United States went down a very different path in terms of continuing to support the development of nuclear energy, and the president, the president supported that than Germany did. Could, could you talk a little bit about how important it is for, during periods of crisis, for leaders to have good scientific advice? Because I think, I think you played a role there in us not 
going down the path Germany did. Well, I, I could tell a lot of stories about that and take the rest of the time and more, but uh, yes, I was very much involved in that. Uh, so was Steve Chu, mm -hmm. Secretary of Energy at the time, and subsequently Ernie Meniz, who became the Energy Secretary in the second term. We, we were of one view uh, between the splendid Secretaries of Energy that we had and, and my office in the White House, and we communicated that view very clearly to President Obama on many different occasions, uh, including at the time of the Fukushima accident, we all met in the Situation Room with the President. There were some very dumb things said by some of the people in the room. Um, okay. uh, a great example was the U.S. Ambassador to China was on the phone at the time, he said, uh, to Japan, he said the Japanese government would like to be able to use the aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan to land emergency helicopters, refuel them, and fly back into the damage zone because that would be a whole lot quicker than having to fly back to their bases further away. And one of the people in the room or on the screen said, oh, we can't really do that. Helicopter pilots, the Japanese helicopter pilots don't know how to land on aircraft carriers. And another person said, and our aircraft carrier could be contaminated by the radioactivity. And another person said, and who's going to pay for the fuel? <laughs> and, and I said, I spoke up immediately, and I said, first of all, anybody who can fly a helicopter can land it on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> Helicopters are so hard to fly that the additional complication of landing it on an aircraft carrier is nothing. And immediately then, the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff spoke up. And he said, and by the way, our teams train every day on radioactive decontamination. This is just like an exercise. And then he said, and one more thing. Anybody who at a time like this is worried about who will pay for the fuel is a horse's ass. <laughs> 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 and two hours later, the Japanese helicopters were landing on the deck of the USS. Vice, capable, competent vice matters. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Please. Um, my name is uh, Ganapati Yadav. I'm from Mumbai. I was just inducted yesterday. I have two comments and two questions. <laughs> By 2050, we will be 9 billion plus people. Our energy requirements will be 49,000 terawatt hours then, of which 73% will come from renewable energy, of which 25% will be from hydrogen. So the new trinity, if the religious term is to be used, will be solar, wind, and hydrogen. And the decarbonization will be possible if we have carbon dioxide refineries. And Government of India has planned by 2030, 50% of our energy will come from green hydrogen and green ammonia. But that kind of policy is not in place in the Western world. Now Germany and France have gone back to coal-fired power plants. What do you say? Well, thank you for those comments. Uh, it turns out that one of the projects that I'm involved in at Harvard is a project on collaborating on the pathway to deep carbon reductions with both China and India. And one of our major focuses is on green hydrogen and on the potential of green hydrogen, not just in China and India, but in the United States and the European Union and, and other countries. I think we're making progress. We just produced a major analysis of the green hydrogen possibility for the EU. Um, so I completely agree with you. I think green hydrogen has a big role to play, but it also has a way to go. Uh, we need to improve the technologies of producing green hydrogen as well as storing it and transporting it uh, in order for it to play the role that we hope it will. And this is one of so many areas which, in which, as I've argued, uh, we need more technology to bring us to where we need to go. Thank you. Hi there. First, um, John, excellent lecture. I thought it was beautiful and I learned so much about it. Uh, my name is John Davies. I'm an inductive class of 2022 ex-Intel. 
And really what I'd like to ask you is on the supply side. I saw lots of efforts on the um, infrastructure acts that seem to be very much in the um, Inflation Reduction Act on the demand side, create incentives. But the supply side, it's really the raw materials that I'm concerned with. And it goes back to about 50 years ago. That was my PhD in rare earths. I bought every one of them from the United States, actually. Mine's here. They don't exist anymore here. Um, there's a lot of materials that have to be dug out of the ground to make the energy transition. And those materials are not renewable. Specifically, not just the lithium, the copper, but the manganese, the nickel, the cobalt, and specifically the rare earths. On the last four, we're almost completely dependent on other countries, many of which don't seem to be particularly friendly with the US at this point. Can you make some comments on the supply side so we don't get ourselves completely yeah. dependent? No, thank on... you very much for that, for that comment. I, I did refer in passing to the supply side challenges, the supply chain challenges. I had another slide on this topic, a very busy slide with lots of examples of the sort that you've talked about, of the various materials that we have to dig out of the ground and where we currently, the places on which we currently depend for them. And it ended up on the cutting room floor because of the time limit mm. for my presentation. But I think you would have rather it had not ended up on the cutting room floor. I probably should have made more about that point. Can I request that it come back from the cutting room floor in a lot of the conversations? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I concur. The, the supply side is, is an extraordinarily important <clears throat> element. You can't solve this by just demand, but also it takes increased supply, and that requires a lot of challenging things to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Um, hi, my name is Eric Udrin. I'm a member of Section 6. Um, and I work with my colleagues on one tiny corner of the world that you're talking about, which is control and protection systems for the electric grid that will operate one of many scenarios you've talked about. You've given us this impactful, uh, overarching, troubling description of where we are headed and talked about programs and actions and investments uh, that you feel need to be made so that we can overcome these challenges or at least address them to some extent. Um, but one area that uh, I thought uh, wasn't really covered, and I'm wondering what the big picture is, is where are we going to find the human and other resources to absorb and effectively utilize the levels of investment you've described? My perception is that right now we are challenged going at the level that we're going. Uh, who is working on how we could possibly have the expertise and the uh, other resources in the whole supply chain to carry out a fraction of the work that's listed as necessary? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I will mention that two of the biggest studies uh, conducted by, led by the Department of Energy in the Obama administration uh, were studies of what we need to do about the electricity grid, uh, which is the area you're working on, and certainly one of the biggest challenges in the energy future. Uh, we will never get what we need uh, from wind and solar uh, without an enormous upgrading of the electricity grid. Uh, but neither will we be able to cope with the challenges that climate change is imposing on the current grid without a massive upgrading. Where are we going to get the people? Uh, For everything you talked about, not only the grid. That and everything else. Obviously, we, I didn't talk about STEM education and the education of specialists in these different domains, but that's another very important area to which we devoted a lot of attention, including on the Obama PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, of which uh, Susan Graham, sitting in the front row, a uh, member of this academy, was one of the productive members. And uh, we... we had a whole lot to say about what needs to be done to upgrade the workforce, to upgrade the pipeline, uh, as well as what needs to be done to educate the public to provide the political support for what needs to be done. It's a big topic. I could have given the whole lecture on that, but again, <laughs> time limits intruded. Very good. Next question. Yes, I'm Ron Latanison. I'm a retread professor of material science and engineering from MIT. I now work with the engineering consulting company, Exponent. 
I wanted to pick up on your comments about the absence of both political and public will to address this problem. Both the, in poli politics is notoriously short term, as is the public mindset. And it just strikes me that there are two possible approaches that might be useful in addressing that short term character. Number one, many of the people in this room, or people with the personalities of those in this room, ought to run for public office. <laughs> and then secondly, more of us should be appointed as one uh, the gentleman on our stage, John Holdren, had done, to an important public position. But secondly, it also seems to me that we as engineers and technologists ought to engage social scientists in what we do. And we haven't done that very well. This is a very, very massive public social issue. And I think it, it is time that perhaps we changed our vision of the relationship between engineering and social science. Both are very good points. I, I, I first um, <laughs> took material science and engineering at MIT and benefited, <laughs> benefited greatly. Uh, but the point that more technical people should run for public office is one that I've often made in other talks. Should have added it to my list of, of what we need to do. Very, very good point. And working with social sciences is, is something that uh, I found to be important starting in uh, 1970. When I went to Caltech after getting my PhD, well that was actually 72, I first went to the Livermore lab, but I went to Caltech, and one of my appointments at Caltech was in the Department of Humanities and Social Science. Hmm. And ever since I've been working with social scientists, I w I've actually been made a life member of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, the only natural scientist to receive that award. And they did that, <laughs> they did that because of the work I did in the Obama administration to bring social science into these considerations in a more vigorous way. It's immensely important. Uh, we need to do it. And when I talked about working across stovepipes, one of the things I meant was really interdisciplinary collaboration yeah. uh, across these yeah. domains. Very Thank good. I'm, I'm authorized to take an extra five minutes, so, but let's, let's move along. And uh, next question. Hi, I'm Mary Hill from the University of Kansas. I work a lot with farmers and food supply and, and, and in water originally, but uh, have moved into policy and science. Um, I have two, uh, two things. One, one is that um, engaging people and the population is just critical. I mean, they're the people who have to make the adaptations. We, the people in this room would be a, a, just a drop in the bucket. We have to get everybody on board. And the only way they're going to do that is if they can see a way through that they're going to make money, that they can, that they can uh, maintain their standard of living going forward. So they have to have that. Um, one of the things I'm working with with a project is um, green ammonia, locally powered green, green ammonia produced in smaller plants by that are farmer owned and uh, taking taking ammonia which is really pretty monopolistic at this point and a form of hydrogen you know energy uh, um, and bringing it into the hands of the local pop populace and let them make the money okay because they've been ammonia prices you over the last year went from $500 to $1,600 a, a ton, a metric ton. Um, uh, so that's been huge. So one thing is getting the, 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 the things in the hands of the people much more. And the other is to look at, <laughs> look at how our economy became oil-based and how that was engineered and how we can learn to engineer it in the other way, and again, it's getting people involved. It's it's Ford and saying, you know, get a car in every, you know, to every, make it affordable, making making doing thinking things carbon free affordable. So, that's short answer is I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next question. I am Zdeněk Bajant from Northwestern University, and Section Ten. I wish to congratulate you for an outstanding lecture. But I'm puzzled why you left out one major subject, emissions of CO2 from the production of cement and concrete. They are equal to the emissions now, approximately, from all the cars and trucks in the world. And they are on steep upward trajectory 
not US, but worldwide. Uh, this is a subject which is also not receiving enough attention. You don't hear much about it in the media, in, in politics, and investments in this problem are far too small compared to other technologies. Uh, it's a difficult subject uh, because uh, efforts over the last 40 years already reduced cement content of concrete to one half. There is little, somewhat little can be improved in fly ash, adding uh, slag, but these are all dirty materials, of course. Uh, on the molecule level, there's a major challenge, but for some reason, material science department are not interested in the subject. I don't understand why. Th it, is, slide, it is major. That slide is also on the cutting room floor. <laughs> uh, we, we do work on that topic in, in my program. It, it, it's being worked on in the School Great. of Engineering and Applied Science, whose Dean Frank Doyle is sitting in the audience here. Uh, I know a lot of folks who are working on it, and again, I apologize. I left a lot out <laughs> in the interest of, I understand. of time. But I think it should be added. <laughs> it's, it's a major Thumbs aspect. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. My name's John Kuhn. I'm an environmental engineer. My first career was working with engineering firms and manufacturing industry to address water problems. My second career is a professor of practice in the environmental engineering program at Georgia Tech. Um, and thanks for your words. Somebody else characterized them as, a down, as downer words. I agree, but frankly, I don't think anything else would have had the credibility that your words to us did. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that, that a, a, a subject on the climate change issue that no one wants to talk about is with the world's population. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I started working on the population dimension of these issues in September 1968 with the Stanford population biologist Paul Ehrlich. Uh, we wrote together a number of books, a large number of papers, arguing that whatever else you do, if the population of the world grows without limit, we're cooked. And uh, I still believe that, although we have seen quite a lot of progress in many parts of the world, largely because of the improved condition of women. When women have more education, more opportunities, uh, they reduce their fertility. And the result is that the population of the world, while it's already in many respects too big, is growing more slowly, much more slowly than it used to uh, because of that. We can hope that can continue and we can try to spread it to Africa, which is the last remaining bastion of high population growth rates. Uh, when, when some of us worked on a study in the uh, uh, 2004 to 2007 period for the United Nations on uh, population and development. We were the first international study. We had uh, 18 members from 11 countries, including, by the way, uh, China, India, and Russia. And we reported to the Secretary General of the UN with an explicit projection of how much difference in addressing the climate change challenge it would make if the population future were the UN low projection versus the UN high projection. Next question. My name, my name is Ravi Kulkarni. I am from India. I am the new inductee of 2022. And um, uh, I run a, a specialty chemical company in India. My question is that it's, it's not uh, most often when you solve one problem, uh, 10 new problems show up. You, you, you so solve one problem, other problems show up from, uh, from various sides. So when we are trying to solve such a big problem of climate change, what other problems are going to show up, uh, which uh, obviously not, uh, because it's not going to be one-on-one. -on -one. Case in point is that the mining industry is very highly polluting industry. When you talk about um, uh, lithium extractions or um, uh, what do you call um, uh, copper, for example, this, this amount of this material to be needed will be very high, like four to five times more than what we normally produce right now. And they are going to create huge new issues concerning pollution. So we solve one problem, something else will come in. So can you just comment, can you, can you please comment on how, what other problems are going to show up 
when we actually solve this problem <laughs> and how do we handle them? Thank you. Thank you for that comment, although this is too big a question to address <laughs> in, in the time remaining. You know, the, the so-called first law of ecology is that everything is connected to everything else. And you're absolutely right. We so often, in trying to solve one problem, encounter a different one. And one of the reasons we need <clears throat> more interdisciplinary education and more working groups that bring together people from across sectors and across stovepipes is to get better at identifying these connections and figuring out how to address them. Very good. And we are, <coughs> I, I, I apologize, we're very close to the limit on our time. I'm going, to, I hope we can go with just two more questions and from, from this side of the room. Okay, first, thank you for a really exceptional presentation. Um, I think I heard a talk for Jennifer Doudner who talked about editing DNA and the future of humanity. You're talking about dealing with the uh, uh, global warming and the future of humanity. Now, one of your charts showed the different uh, uh, sources of energy, and I was surprised to see how little of it was from hydroelectric. That was, I had not seen that before. What about using the tides to somehow build fantastic hydroelectric plants that to generate energy from the tides. There was a plan years ago to put something across the Bay of Fundy and use the, uh, the moon, basically, to give us energy. Is there any reasonable thought that this could be a major source of practical energy? Well, there are three problems with using the tides. One is that the locations that are really attractive in terms of the tidal range and the topography are relatively limited so that the magnitude of the contribution to this huge energy system that we're dealing with uh, is likely to stay modest. Uh, the second problem is a broader one in ocean engineering, and there's a lot of work on other ways to extract energy from the oceans, energy from the waves, energy from the currents. <clears throat> but the big challenge in all cases is building systems that can survive in the ocean environment which is very harsh, uh, both chemically and physically, and still do that at affordable cost. Uh, I encourage people who are working on that. I hope we see more success in ocean energy in general, but it's a tough domain. Okay, thank you. Excellent, and our last question. Hello, Dr. Holdren. Uh, it was an honor to serve with you, with the President, and uh, I have a line that I say, government is just who shows up. So first off, thank you for showing up so often, so frequently. I just wanted to add kind of a dual subject into our conversation, which I know is close to your heart, which is, um, first part is, like, who is included? And we started a program with the President called Image of STEM. So maybe the best example there is footnote, pun intended, uh, of Eunice Newton foot, the invisible woman from the 1850s who first spoke about greenhouse glass, gases. So all the people, all our colleagues, uh, mostly people of color, um, underrepresented women, who are already solving these problems but are not having the funding and not having what they need, and kind of connecting the first special lecture from the Academy about inclusion to your lecture uh, about how do we get everyone moving and the fact that so many people are already moving but they're less known. And the second part of that would be when the Paris summit was happening, I was thinking about a Dakota summit. And I don't think people would put a pipeline through Arlington Cemetery, but people were happy to put a pipeline through the Standing Rock Cemetery. And how do we sort of get more respect for all the colleagues around the world and sort of think about Justice 40 or environmental justice as part of the solution making uh, as we work in just any comments. And again, thank you for your terrific service. Number one, you're absolutely right. And, and number two. Oh, sorry, Megan Smith. I was the United States Chief Technology Officer serving with Dr. Holdren. Uh, and uh, we're MIT colleagues and too. And Megan, you know very well that we did in the Obama administration give uh, a lot of emphasis to those dimensions. Yes. And I think all of us who work there in our separate capacities today continue to do it. I think the Obama administration was the first one where meetings of the president's senior staff every morning at 8.30 in the Roosevelt Room were half women. Yeah. And meetings of the OSTP 
senior staff were two-thirds women when yes. you were there. Yes. So uh, we worked hard on that, and we're working hard today on inclusion, not just of women, but other underrepresented groups. And it's what I loved about what you did was we all just made it so right away, and we didn't wait. We just knew it was true, and so we made that happen. And so I just wanted us as a group and in our leadership positions. you deserve positions. a lot of credit. Yeah, and you with you, teamwork. Um, among other things, you probably took a tenfold salary cut when you left Google. <laughs> when that you I left did. Google to come to the to come to the White House. And I was happy to do it. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, at this point, I, I do want to, again, thank all of the members of the Special Lecture Committee and especially Cleo Caboz for, for helping us to go through this process uh, and identify an outstanding speaker, John Holdren, to come and, and, and talk with us today. I, I, I'm, I'm always inspired. We will reconvene here. I believe at 1015, uh, continuing in the basic theme to transitioning to net zero carbon with some fascinating speakers. At this point, please, let's thank John Holdren.